May the blood of Jesus be our all. That's our heart song, Father. That's our passion. We know the wages of sin is death, and so you have affirmed throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We know today more and more people are ashamed of the gospel that we preach, a blood redemption. But thank you, beginning with Adam, you showed him that works of righteousness are impossible. Fig leaf religion can never forgive or save, but you shed blood, you killed animals and gave them coats of skin, picturing ultimately the Lamb of God who would be slain for us. Lord Jesus, we bow in your presence confessing that we have not been bought with silver or gold, but with your precious blood. So help us to glorify you in our bodies. May our life be a, an expression of gratitude for all that you've done for us. May we truly focus on things that matter, things that are eternal. May we take the routine events of life that we must live and use them as an expression of your goodness and even opportunity. We ask this morning as we are in your word that you would take it. You have called it food for the soul. And so help us to feed on the bread of life, the written word. I pray that you would help me to rightly divide it, come and fill me and use me and anoint me. And may the spirit of God touch the lives of those who know you. May we be challenged together and may he take this truth and help those who have never met you. May today be a turning point, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you this morning to take a Bible and turn to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. If you're new to the Bible, it's pretty easy to find. It's the very first book in the New Testament. And if you're joining us for the first time, we are in between books of a verse-by-verse -verse exposition, and we are doing a series called God's Prophetic Schedule. And these are indeed exciting days. There are world leaders speaking about a new world order, about a global reset. And if you know your Bible, that shouldn't surprise you because these are things the Scripture speaks will happen. Now, before we finish this series, I hope to discuss this subject in detail. But the reality is, is it will not happen, at least in its initial stage, until the Antichrist comes. But the fact that people are speaking in these terms is of great significance because this is what the Antichrist is going to attempt to do. But ultimately, the real new world order, the real global reset will take place when Jesus comes. Listen to these words in the Revelation. Revelation eleven thirteen: the kingdom of this world. Now, I know we sing the kingdoms of this world, but it's actually singular in the Greek New Testament the kingdom of this world. Because when Adam rebelled against God, he lost his right to rule. And the God of this world has now basically been given that kingdom. And that's why in a very real legitimate way, he offered Jesus, bow down and worship me and I'll give you this world. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Now, many are trying to bring this about. They hope that somehow we can manipulate the world to make it a better place to live, but that's really like shining the brass on the Titanic, rearranging the chairs on its deck because it's going under. Ultimately, this world, be realistic, the Bible teaches it is going to be burned and destroyed with fire. Now, I know when you preach that, people laugh at you, they make fun of you, but mockery has always been one of Satan's chief tools, ridicule, scoffing, mockery. Why? Because he really doesn't have anything else to say. Not to mention that's his very nature. Jesus said he does not stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks and utters lies. And so Mr. Liar, because he has no real substance, will attack those of us who preach the word of God. They'll call us narrow, bigoted, literalist, homophobic, purita puritanical. They'll come up with all kinds of terms to try to discourage you. But you shouldn't be discouraged. It's 
something that scripture says will happen especially at the end of the age scoffers will come we did a whole message on that very thing there's always been scoffing but it's going to intensify at the end of the age and it's one aspect of persecution now to help us to visualize where we are and where we've been this chart uh, might help us to see it if you can notice here the next great event on God's prophetic schedule is called the rapture and so we open this series dealing with Israel's rebirth and the rapture of the church. Nothing is ever needed to be fulfilled prophetically for the rapture to take place. Whereas the second coming, that is a prophetically driven event. And after the rapture, there's a small space of time. We don't know exactly how long, weeks, days, months. Some would say years, but I'm very doubtful that it would be years in light of the way the prophetic schedule is unfolded in the New Testament. A uh, covenant is made with Israel, and that makes the clock begin to tick for a seven-year period known as the tribulation period. In Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week prophecy of Daniel, if that's a new term, maybe think about going back and listening to the message on Daniel 9. There's actually four on that. But that seven-year period is divided into two halves. In the middle, you have the abomination of desolation. Three and a half years of tribulation, that one event takes place, and then three and a half years of great tribulation, things intensify significantly. That ushers in the second coming of Christ and his thousand year reign upon the earth. Now God could have certainly have raptured the church in 300 AD, but he didn't. He could have certainly uh, gathered the Jewish people from the ends of the earth in 300 AD, and then brought about the second coming of Christ. But he didn't. In fact, he waited nearly two millennia to do what the scriptures predicted, that he would gather the Jewish people. And seemingly nothing happened for 1,900 years. And then God supernaturally has brought the Jewish people back into the land. And just as the prophet said, they became a nation in a single day. Reestablish them. And so uh, we also studied uh, the world powers that will be involved at the end of time as we studied Ezekiel 38 and the battle of Gog and Magog. Here's a picture just taken three weeks ago. Again, these three world leaders from Russia, Iran, and Turkey, they are three major nations that the scripture predicts will work together to try to destroy Israel. And so again, the fact that God is fulfilling prophecy, these, these nations, by the way, forever have been enemies. But they are common bedfellows for the objective of driving Israel into the sea. And so when you see God fulfilling prophecy for the second coming, then you know the rapture is that much closer. And then if you remember, we studied the day of the Lord that will come like a thief in the night. Again, this chart, just to visualize it, the day of the Lord is like the day of your youth. It's not a single day. It's a protracted period of time. It begins in darkness with the great tribulation. The second coming, when Jesus comes back, it will be bright and glorious for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, it will get dark again. And so it's a period of time that begins with the tribulation. And so sometimes when you read of the day of the Lord, it's just descriptive of a horrible time. But in other Old Testament passages, it's descriptive of a magnificent, beautiful time. Well, it depends what part of the day of the Lord that you are in. And then from there, we went on and we looked at apostasy. You know, there is a coming apostasy like the world has never seen, the apostasy. We're going to study the apostasy. We haven't come to that. But the fact is, is that at the end of time, there'll be growing apostasy. That is people who have been exposed to the truth, but have rejected the truth. There'll be growing mockers at the end of time. There'll be the moral permissiveness of Noah's day and the sexual perversion of Lot's day. And so with Israel in the land and all of these things happening together, there's a convergence of signs that you almost have to be blind. And of course, uh, the lost will be in shock when the church is raptured and then the day of the Lord begins. But Paul reminds us, but you brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you like a thief. 
So in one respect, I suppose it will be a surprise for everybody because no one knows the exact day or hour when Christ will come and catch up his church. But we should know the times and the seasons, Paul says. We're not in darkness. We're sons of light. We should be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. Now, this morning, we're going to focus on the first 14 verses of the Olivet Discourse. We call it the Olivet Discourse because it was given on the Mount of Olives. And there are two chapters, 24 and 25, that in the months... I say months, I'm not sure how long, um, maybe the month ahead, we will work through this portion of Scripture. I want to begin by reading our text, Matthew 24. I hope you've brought a Bible. Follow along, beginning now in verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, by way of introduction, I want us to consider the setting, because if you miss the setting, you'll miss the significance of what is unfolding in this chapter of Scripture. If you remember, if you look back into chapters 22 and 23, Jesus rebukes the leadership of Israel for their hypocrisy and for their unbelief. And uh, he compares those, that generation that he ministered to, to those who in prior generations murdered and slaughtered the prophets of God. Notice in Matthew 23 and in verse 36, Jesus said, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And of course, these things refers to the rejection and the persecution of God's man in verses 33 to 35, not to mention the destruction of the temple and the scattering of the Jewish people to the four corners of the earth. And so this generation will suffer. Why? Because of its leaders and because the people didn't abandon their leaders but followed their leaders they will suffer with them. Not all Jews rejected Jesus. The early church was initially all Jewish. But overall, he came to his own, but his own received him not. And so if they had only responded, the Lord would have been able to have protected them. And yet, like a loving parent, he doesn't abandon Israel. Look at verse 37 of chapter 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, in the older edition of the NASB, it says, Oh, Jerusalem. It's in the vocative. And that's important because there's a deep sense of emotion that's being expressed here. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Not unable, but unwilling. Jesus wants to gather his people, but instead he predicts they're going to be scattered, and that will happen through the judgment that the Romans will bring 68 to 70 AD. Then in uh, Luke 21 and verse 24, we're given some details to fill it in. It It says there, and they will fall this coming day. They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Jesus predicts here in the Mount of Olives, the Romans are going to come, 
They're going to destroy the temple, and the Jewish people are going to be scattered to all the nations of the world. And by the way, that is precisely what history records is happening. And so in verse 38, Matthew gives us some details of this coming invasion. It was in the future from Jesus' perspective, obviously. He said, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And of course, every Jew understood the term house and in this context to refer to the house of Yahweh, the house of the Lord, the temple, the house of God is going to be left desolate. And so while God promised to scatter the Jewish people to all the nations of the world, he would not abandon the Jewish people. Look at verse 39. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until. You should circle that word until. It's critical to understanding the whole verse. You will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Aranai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So not only does this verse speak of the certainty of this coming judgment, it also looks to a future time of blessing and faith upon the nation. And it's an important verse because it's a reminder, Jesus Christ cannot come back at the second coming until the Jewish people acknowledge that this one who came in the name of the Lord They will acknowledge indeed that he did. They will say before his second coming, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this context is important in terms of verse one and this house being left desolate. And so notice the discussion that begins. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away from his disciples, uh, going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Now, Mark 13 adds a small detail, but important. Let me read 13.1. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, Herod began to build the temple in 20 B.C. And even after he died in 4 B.C., it continued. Uh, In fact, when Jesus was alive, he stated in John chapter 2 that it had been under construction for a total of 46 years. In fact, it wasn't completed until 64 A.D. when Herod Antipas finally did it. Now, some people call it the third temple, because it's a total rebuild. But technically, most will refer to it as the second temple. Because Herod the Great, as Herod Antipas, had an agreement. There are seven Herods in the New Testament. So you always want to ask which one. Most of you know at least Herod the Great, right, from Christmas. And Herod Antipas, the one before whom Jesus stood and was condemned. They had an agreement that the temple would never be shut down. You know, there was a, there's a fellow not far from here, just up the street, and he had a, up on stilts this, uh, ma- re- you know, a manufactured home, a, a trailer, and he wanted to tear it down and build a house. And the county said, no, you can't do that. We won't let you do that. So what he did is he, he built around the trailer. He built a house right around the trailer, and then he dismantled the trailer piece by piece from the inside. I went into that house one day to share the gospel with him. It was a magnificent thing he did. That's kind of what Herod did. He literally built a new house all the way around the old temple and dismantled the one that was on the inside. And it was indeed magnificent. But since it was never shut down, it's typically referred to as the second temple. Teacher, look, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, obviously, the disciples' comments were indeed purposeful. They had seen Jesus earlier in the week on Palm Sunday literally weep, one of three times when he weeps in Scripture. And here, brokenhearted on this day, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who stones the prophets and so forth. And he is speaking of the house of God being left desolate. How is this going to happen? Why would it happen? Well, again, remember they had seen his salty tears. They had seen his broken heart. So indeed, they are wondering, how is this going to unfold? In addition, remember the Jewish people beginning with the tabernacle, which in a couple places is actually called a temple. And then the later more permanent structure that Solomon built, and that was torn down, and then Zerubbabel built one, and Herod rebuilt it. 
the way the people related to God was through this worship center. So if there's no worship center, how are we going to relate to you if the temple is left desolate? It's an important question. And of course, on Thursday night of that week, he is going to have the Lord's Supper and he's going to remind them of the new covenant spoken of in the Old Testament that he would initiate and enact with his own shed blood that we just sang about. But this temple was breathtaking. It was covered in gold and silver and copper and bronze and even the limestone was whitewashed. Uh, Josephus called it a mountain of snow and a mountain of gold. And Jesus said to them, verse two, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Maybe I thought about it this week. What would be a parallel statement in our day? Well, in 1990, the World Trade Centers, at least at the time, for a short time, were the two largest buildings in the world. Can you imagine someone saying, you see these twin towers? Not one floor will be left upon another. And people would think, are, are, you, are you crazy? And for Jesus to make this statement, it was incredibly dramatic. It's going to be left desolate. It's almost inconceivable. And he said here, not one stone would be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now remember, there is already seeds of rebellion that have been planted in the empire, and many people didn't want Jesus because he wasn't a part of that insurrection. In fact, on the day in which he was crucified, you will remember there are two thieves, one on either side. They're involved in an insurrection. They're Jewish men. People say, oh, the two thieves, you know, they didn't understand anything about much of anything, and he just kind of loosely, oh, Jesus saved me. That's sheer nonsense. That's an abuse of scripture. He was a Jew. He understood that the one he had been blaspheming and mocking was the one the scriptures spoke of. The one who had a kingdom that it wasn't over for Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was the promised Messiah, the one who would come and die and be buried and raised from the dead, who would have a kingdom. Jesus, remember me. So this insurrection is already in play, but it is only going to expand and broaden, which of course will bring Roman judgment. Now, history records, uh, let me read a verse first, Luke 21, 20. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, this is going to be the Roman response to this coming insurrection, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now, Jesus does not want the true believers to suffer. And so he gives them a warning about when this destruction and judgment where not one stone is left upon another will take place. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and he says at that point, you should flee to the mountains. And of course, history records that the Romans did not want to waste a single Roman life in overthrowing Rome. So what did they do? They did what you sometimes did. They put a siege around the city. They encircled the city of Jerusalem, hoping to starve the Jewish people out. Now, typically, when a siege came, those who were on the outside would flee to the inside, and those who were on the inside would never leave. Jesus gave the exact opposite counsel. When you see these Roman troops come, get out of Dodge. And by the way, Luke recorded Jesus' teaching of this siege. In fact, Mark and Luke give similar warning of a coming time as well that is still in the future. And so this in some ways is a dress rehearsal of another siege that is going to come upon the city of Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation. Now, if you know the Romans and you've read much Roman history, then you already know that they were not destroyers of temples. They were preservers. And I think part of that was maybe superstition. You don't destroy the temple of another god. And Titus, as Josephus records, has given, had given specific orders not to destroy the temple. But remember, the temple is layered and covered in gold and silver. And somehow, some flaming arrow, or however it happened, hit the temple, and the great cedars of Lebanon began to burn, and it went up in flames. And all that gold and silver melted and went between the cracks. Add to that, it was rumored that there was great chambers with treasures in them. And so 
with mighty crowbars or whatever they used, they literally pried apart the rocks to get the gold trap between the rocks. In Jesus' prophecy, was fulfilled where not one stone was left upon another. Here's a photo of some of those very stones. Some of you have stood with me in this spot there in the city of Jerusalem, and one of the stones that's a little brown on the front, that stone is taller than I am. <laughs> These are huge stones. You can't, I should have taken a picture of myself in the picture to give you a little definition. These are massive stones. And not one stone was left upon the other. The only thing that was left, of course, was the retaining wall that Herod built. The top was wiped off. And by the way, it's a reminder that we don't first live by reason. We live by revelation. It may seem by reason that the Twin Towers would never fall. And it may seem by reason that God's temple would never come down because now we're not talking about the might and power of America to protect one of its buildings. We're talking about God's house. God Almighty. We're speaking of his magnificent house. How is this going to come down? You don't live by reason. You live by revelation. And that's why there's many replacement theologians today. Christians who say God is done with Israel. How did they come to that conclusion? Well, there are a number of factors, but one being is nothing happened with the Jews for 1,900 years. So you had a ripe uh, environment to say that God was done with the Jewish people. But of course, he's not. And God said he would gather them at the end of time, and he did precisely what he wrote. In further describing the setting, we read now in verse 3, And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, notice the scene changes. If you go back to chapter 21, they enter into the temple. Now they have left the temple, and they're sitting on the Mount of Olives, and they're looking across the Kidron Valley at the temple. And they come to him in private, and Mark 13 tells us there's four disciples who come to him, Peter, James, John, and Andrew specifically. And he's no longer speaking to the large group. He's speaking just to these four disciples. And if, if you were sitting today on the Mount of Olives, this is what you'd see you would see that same temple platform, it's 35 acres square, and on it this pagan building, the Dome of the Rock along with one of their mosques next to it and some other smaller buildings. And God willing, next fall we will go back to Israel and maybe some of you will come and you will see this. But what did they see in Jesus' day? This is what they saw, they saw the house of the Lord. And so the disciples, they, they come to him in private, and he's doing precisely what he had already said after the nation officially rejected him and said, you're not God, you're, you're the devil's man, Matthew 12. Then Matthew 13, Dr. Pentecost used to always say, the way to understand chapter 13 is to know that chapter 12 comes before it. I'll never forget that. He burned that into my heart. They reject the nation, and so they reject Jesus. So in 13, he begins to speak to them in parables. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And so the Olivet Discourse is not given to everyone. It's in a private meeting. And so they're asking. Remember, uh, when when, when Abraham saw, said the great pyramid had been in place for a 1,000 years. When Moses saw it, it had been in place for 1,500 years. If Jesus and Mary saw it when they made their pilgrimage to Egypt, it had been in place for 3,000 years. And today it still stands 5,000 years later in some of the stones. And the great period, most of them were far smaller than the stones given in the temple. So it's inconceivable that this temple is going to come down. And so they're asking a penetrating question. Tell us when these things will happen. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? You'll notice three questions, though grammatically in Greek, two questions where the second question has two parts. Notice first they ask, tell us when will these things happen? They're referring to the prediction of the destruction of the temple. As already noted, that would be a fantastic event. 
The temple was three times the size of the Dome of the Rock. And they wanted to just know, how can this happen? They knew it couldn't just happen unless there was a plan and men deliberately somehow tore it down. How is it going to take place? In addition, they asked this question, when? When is it going to happen? Now remember, this is an important question, not only as it relates to the temple, but to what Jesus just said, I can't come and establish my kingdom until, until the Jews say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so the Jewish conversion is critical to the second coming of Christ. And what will be the sign of your coming Coming there is parousia, and so you will often hear pastors and theologians speak about the parousia. That's a reference to the second coming of Jesus. It was used in Koine Greek of a great king who was coming, and people would prepare for the coming of a king or sometimes even a governor. It can be used in less dramatic ways, but typically it's used of the coming of the Messiah in the New Testament when he will rule and reign over the earth in authority and in power. And so when will your coming take place? And notice the third question, or the second part of the second question, what will be the sign of your coming? That's the second question. And the end of the age. Now the old English says the end of the world, but it's the word age, and so the new King James rightly renders it the end of the age. If you've read the preface to the King James 1611 version. They admitted that there was a lot of Greek words they were still learning and trying to understand and that there would be better translations to follow. And two years later, they came out with another one. And a few years later after that, and they kept refining it. But it's best here, the end of the age, because he's speaking about the end of this age and the start of a coming age when Messiah will rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, with that said, Jesus is going to look down the corridors of time and he's going to give them some signs, some pegs that they can hold on to so we will know and understand when his coming will be. Now, that's all by way of introduction. <laughs> you still with me? All right, now I got 72 points. No, seven points, seven points. All right, first, this coming time, there will be a time of false Christ. There'll be a time of false Christ. We read that here in verses four and five. And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. So the first characteristic is there's going to be false Christ. And the emphasis here in verse five is on the word many. You should maybe circle that. Jesus is warning that one of the marks of the end of, the time, of, the end of time, the end of the age, will be great deception. Now even today, people are being deceived, but it is going to be accelerated. But we need to be ready even in our day. Remember what John said in 1 John? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. That's why you need to know the word of God. Because if you don't know the word of God, you can't really test truth from error. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of Christ Every, the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. So in one sense, for 2,000 years, the spirit of Antichrist has been operational. And the word anti, literally, uh, is the Greek prefix, anti, transliterated, like in English, A-N-T-I, and it means instead of or against. And the meaning is applied in both ways in reference to this one who will embody that spirit, a literal physical man who will be called the Antichrist. He will come in the place of Christ. He will come against Christ. Now, let me pause for just a moment to remind you that John indicates that since the inception of the church, since Pentecost, the spirit of Antichrist has been at work. But it's going to crescendo in this future day. And so Jesus says, see to it that no one misleads you, implying there's a very real possibility of being misled. 
And this is going to be widespread in this coming time. In fact, he'll repeat it again during the second half of the tribulation. If you look at verse 24, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Just because a man comes doing miracles doesn't mean he's a man from God because the devil is a great deceiver. A deceiver, a false teacher, a false pastor, a false prophet doesn't walk into a church with a sign around his neck saying, I am a false teacher. But if you read the book of Jude, you discover there are certain marks and characteristics by which we can discern a phony, a fake. Now, there's always been imposters in the church, but it seems to be growing, it seems to be multiplying, it seems to be deepening. But it's not until after the rapture that it's going to accelerate because we're going to see that this portion of Scripture is really dealing with the events that come after the rapture of the church. Now, let me make some general observations that I think are sometimes overlooked. First, when you uh, read these two chapters, uh, the focus is on Israel. He's already spoken of Israel's house or Israel's temple that is going to be left desolate. He's speaking of a future day for Israel when the Jews will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And since we know Jesus is going to return, and since we know that he cannot return until the Jewish people say of Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, we know that this is very significant. And of course, as we'll see in our weeks together, this time known as the Great Tribulation is not simply a New Testament doctrine, it's found in the Old Testament. It's called by the prophet Jeremiah the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's designed, among other things, to bring the Jews to repentance and true faith in Jesus. In Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, in describing this day, the prophet says, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved from it. And the previous verse in chapter 30, in verse 3, um, he reminds them that God is going to get them and bring them back into the land. And when they're brought back into the land, it's going to be a time of terror and dread. Let me read uh, verse 5 of that chapter. He says, For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there was no peace. And then in verse 6 of Jeremiah 30, in describing this time frame, he likens it to a man in childbirth. How horrible would that be? He says, ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? And again, in verse 7, he says, alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. This is a time that has never happened in Israel's history, much less in world history, that is going to come upon the whole world, as Jesus said in the Revelation. In Matthew 24, in verse 21, Jesus said this, For at that time there will be great tribulation, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and will never again happen. It's almost a perfect repeat of Daniel 12, 1, if you know that chapter. Unless those days were limited, no one would survive, but those days will be limited because of the elect. So Jesus is using the same exact imagery that Daniel and the prophet Jeremiah uses. Now we know that the great tribulation, again called in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the time of Jacob's trouble. You talk to Orthodox Jews today, they see that as a future event. They say, oh, it's coming. It's a horrible time. The time of Jacob's trouble hasn't happened yet. What is its function? Well, in the chapter before chapter 30, Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Again, the context is in this horrible time. You say, how can this horrible time that is going to come upon the earth give us a sense of future and hope? 
because it's going to result in their conversion and it's going to result in great blessing where the prophet says Messiah will come back and rule and reign. In fact, in chapter 31, he will say this. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. After the tribulation period, because the Jewish people are in faith, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, we use this verse all the time that God's going to give a future and a hope, and God bless those graduates who quote it every year, and, and I'm not saying you can't apply it, but don't miss its meaning. Its meaning is to the Jewish folks. I am going to give you a future and a hope. Now, as you read Jeremiah, you discover there are two gatherings. Don't blend them together. There is a gathering after the Babylonian captivity where they come from one nation. And then there's this gathering when they come from all the nations of the world at the end of time where God gathers them physically. So as Ezekiel will teach, he can renew them spiritually and he's going to use the great tribulation period in which to pull this off. Now, again, this is a very Jewish text. He's speaking here in this chapter of Jerusalem, of Judea, of the Sabbath, of the abomination of desolation that will take place in the temple. Uh, he's not speaking of Washington or Paris or London or Moscow. He's certainly not speaking of uh, Beaufort County. If you're listening online, we are in a area geographically we call the low country. There's no mountains here. Yet Jesus is going to speak to these to flee to the mountains because if you've been there in Jerusalem, it's surrounded by mountains. Now again, for many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and will mislead many. Now no one who takes this as futuristic, and I need to say parenthetically, there are some Christian pastors who say everything in Matthew 24, with the exception of the second coming, happened before 70 AD. It's a distortion of scripture, but they do that because of their replacement theology. And they apply a different principle of interpretation to prophecy than they do to the rest of scripture. The things that Jesus is describing have never happened. How are the prophecies fulfilled for the second coming? Literally, actually, just as he said, for the first coming, literally, actually, that's how they're going to be fulfilled for the second coming. So verses 15 through 26, at least for the futurists, no one deba debates it's the tribulation. Verse 15, that's never happened, the abomination of desolation. Um, verses 27 to 31 here in front of me, that relates to the second coming. The question is concerning verses 4, and 14, 4 to 14. One someone says, hey, did you hear about that earthquake? This must be the end. I remember I was a new Christian. I went to this church, and there was a snowstorm in Worcester, Massachusetts at the end of May, and somebody stood up and said, this is the end. These are the signs that God spoke of. I said, oh, really? And I, I didn't know much of the Bible, but that didn't make much sense to me. One of my professors in seminary was Dr. John Walvert, and I was blessed to have him, and blessed even after he retired. He would hang around the student lounge, and we could go and pick his mind, and even after I became the pastor here, I would call him on occasion. He'd answer my phone calls, and Dr. Walvert wrote this, describing verses 4 to 14. He said, this is a time frame describing, quote, the general characteristics of the age leading up to the end, while at the same time recognizing that the prediction of difficulties which will characterize the entire period between the first and second coming of Christ are fulfilled in an intensified way as the age moves to the end to its conclusion in the Great Tribulation. I would agree with that. While on the one hand, you know, earthquakes and all that, they're significant. Why? Because on the one hand, they, you have to have a pregnancy before the birth pangs can begin. But these are not the birth pangs. What we're going to read and study this morning have never happened, not at least as described here. But it's not like one day just God flips a switch and it all happens. There's a number of things that unfold. To have the apostasy, the apostasies of apostasy in the great tribulation period, you have to have had seeds of apostasy sown for people to follow the Antichrist. That's happening in our day. And so when people call me on the Bible line, they say, hey, is that earthquake? Is this war potentially with China significant? Or 
I would say, well, yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense, again, you have to have a pregnancy to have birth pangs, but no, in the sense, these are not the birth pangs. And so this period of time is divided by a middle event, verse 15, the abomination of desolation. So it will go from tribulation, and then Jesus will use another term, great tribulation. So we're told many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now hold your finger here and turn to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to pop back between Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. So don't lose Matthew 24. And I want you to see, because I don't want to convince you just for my own reason, I want Scripture to interpret Scripture. And I want you to see that this coming description in Matthew 4 is yet to take place in its truest sense because it is is going to unfold in the sealed judgments. Revelation chapter 6, if you remember, they're in heaven and John is there and he says, who is worthy? Who can open up the seals? There's only one who can open it and his name is Jesus. And he breaks open the seals and the first seal is broken. Look at verse 2. I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So we're told he's on a horse that's white, he has a bow, and he has a crown on his head. Who is he? Some sloppily say, oh, this must be Jesus, because Jesus in Revelation 19 is on a white horse. That's about the only comparison. About 30 years ago, Dr. Billy Graham wrote a book called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and indeed he was correct by identifying this man as the coming Antichrist. I mean, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to have ripe opportunity. More than likely, the war of Gog and Magog has happened after the rapture. Again, there's a space of time between the rapture and the signing of the treaty. Millions of believers, many who are leaders across the world, will be gone. There'll be total chaos in the world. Think about all the surgeries that weren't finished, all the planes that crashes, all the cars that crash, and on and on and on. You can think of all these scenarios. It will be a ripe environment for a leader to step on the scene. But he's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't have a bow. He has a sharp sword coming out of his mouth because he's coming to bring judgment. And this man who has a bow, he has no arrows. It's like saying, look, I have a gun, but there's no bullets in it. And he's going to deceive the world with a false peace. And the world will embrace him. It will be the devil's trap. But indeed, beyond these false Christs, and again, when this man steps on the scene, there'll be a multiplicity of other satanic agents who will also represent him. There'll also be a time of unending conflicts. Not only a time of false Christ, but unending conflicts. Let me read verse 6 of Matthew 24. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now you would think in 2,000 years since Jesus was here that we could have somehow solved the problem of war. And of course, World War I was so horrific, so intense, so damaging to the human mind and spirit, man declared it the war to end all wars. But it was a short throw until World War II came. But Jesus makes it clear that the wars of this world will not be completed until he comes back. He says, see to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Now you can think about it. We've got the challenges of North Korea We've got the militaristic spirit of, of the Chinese. We have uh, the Turks and the Iranians and the Russians who want to drive Israel into the sea. In the 6,000 years of recorded history, people say, how old is the world? Well, we only have 6,000 years of recorded history, period. 6,000 years. <laughs> you think maybe it's 6,000 years old? I think so. Thereabouts. But in the 6,000 years of recorded history, they say 600 million people have been killed in wars and half of those in the last 100 years. Add to that the growing terrorism and bombings and hijackings and assassinations and so forth. Now, don't miss this. 
to have what we are going to read here in this chapter called birth pangs, you have to have a pregnancy. So go back to Revelation 6. I hope your finger's still there. And we read here that, again, the church is gone. A door was opened in heaven. The church is not mentioned again to Revelation 19. And another horse, a red horse, verse 4, went out to him who sat on it. It was granted to take peace from the earth that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So he's on a red horse. It's a blood red horse. It's fiery. It's it's a puros horse, the color of blood. He comes, and he comes with death. He comes with blood. He comes with warfare. And John describes him as coming with a great sword. He has some powerful weapon. Maybe it's a weapon of mass destruction. And he takes peace, notice this text says, from the earth, which tells you this is not localized, this war to Israel. This is worldwide in scope. Now, God is the designer of all judgment. It was granted. It was given him permission. God is sovereign in all of this, as we will see. Jesus said, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Let's go to the third sign. Beyond false Christ and unending conflicts, there, this will be a time of supernatural calamities. A time of supernatural calamities. Continue reading with me in verse 7 of Matthew 24. Again, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And then he adds, and in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Now, Jesus, again, he's looking down the corridors of time, and he sees famines, and he sees earthquakes. Luke, in the parallel text, says there will be great earthquakes. So this is not your normal earthquake. This is a great earthquake earthquake, not to mention famines. Now, you would think with our increased agricultural skill and genetic engineering and all the things we have that famine would be eliminated, but it is certainly not. Certainly, there's the failure of agriculture. You know, we're dependent on God. Most farmers are about the only ones who pray. God, please send us rain. God, please stop the rain. God, please help us. All it will take is for God to turn the faucet off to get people's attention. There's a failure of agriculture and there's certainly the failure of distribution. Even when we have food, we can't always get it to the people who need it. As this slide shows, here are the eight leading producers of grain in the world. China's number one. They produce more wheat than any other nation in the world, but they don't have enough wheat to provide for their own. They have to import wheat. That's why they're buying thousands of acres in America. And our Senate is doing nothing about it. You have the Ukrainians. Notice they're eighth on the list. But right now, they can't plant this year because of all the turmoil in the nation. Not to mention there in the Black Sea, there are ships filled with wheat, Ukrainian wheat, and they allowed for the first time in months one to go out this week. And of course, if our former governor, David Beasley, is correct and he heads the UN World Fund uh, Program, World Food Program. He said there'll be starvation this fall, especially in North Africa. And of course, the US right now is not having a good year for a week. Our per acre production is way down. And when you add the world food market, it's predicted this fall the price of a loaf of bread is going to skyrocket. Well, listen, when you have earthquakes, and famines and wars brought together in a small time frame, you can see how this will accelerate. Here's the parallel passage. Are you still in Revelation 6? Let me read verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. So interestingly, while the word famine is not found here, it's implied here. And it's clear that a measure which represents a quart in our terms, a quart of wheat will cost you a denarius. A quart of wheat is enough to bake one loaf of bread. The whole world is going to be in hunger and in starvation. Think about it. I don't know how large your family is. But suppose you had one loaf of bread to divide amongst your whole family 
for one day. Now, the average family size in America is 2.5. In the Middle East, it's 7.7. In Africa, it's 5.3. There's going to be severe food shortages in this coming day. And the wheat, which is the bread that people eat, it will cost you a denarius. A denarius in John's day was a single day's work. So it'll take a whole day's pay to do nothing but buy a loaf of bread. Or you could buy three quarts of barley for a denarius. Barley, and certainly less refined than in our day, it was used in John's day to feed the animals. You can eat animal food for a denarius. So you're in a situation, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take all our money, we're going to buy saltines and crackers to put it in our way of thinking. You work all day and you can either have a single loaf or you can buy food fit for an animal. Supernatural calamities. In addition, number four, it will be a time of widespread death, a time of widespread death. The fourth seal is not directly mentioned in Matthew 24, but certainly the results of famines and earthquakes is implied. Jesus doesn't have to say it, but it is elucidated for us in the fourth rider in Revelation 6. Let me read verses 7 and 8 in Revelation 6. When the Lamb, Jesus, broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And to underscore how serious this is, verse 8 says, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death and Hades was following it. God is simply saying it is death that claims the body. It is Hades that claims his soul. God is just reminding us that no one can climb up in the grave and cover himself over with dirt and hide from God Almighty. You cannot hide from God. Death which many people will try but will be unable, as Revelation teaches, will not be able to spare you from the judgment of God Almighty. When God created you, he created you to live forever. And long after the sun and the moon and the stars are gone, you will live timeless, endless, forever and ever and ever, on and on and on and on, either with the Lord in heaven or apart from him in this awful place called hell. And notice once again, authority was given to him. Like Satan with Job, he can only do what God allows. And so these horsemen that will be instruments of the wrath of God, they're on a leash. They're restricted as to how far they can go. But notice in either case, they're given permission to kill a fourth of the earth. We're going to cross in October for the first time in history, eight billion people. Eight billion people on the earth, they say, come October. That means two billion people will die. Think about that, 25% of the earth's population. We haven't even come to the trumpet and bowl judgments. That would be all the population in China and the US combined. Death in Hades will come by the sword, it will come by famine, it will come by pestilence. The smell of death will be everywhere. One-fourth of the planet at this time, gone. You say, that's cruel. No, it's not. It's grace. It's mercy. It's God getting man's attention one final chance before it is eternally too late because this is nothing compared to the eternal wrath that men will know on the lake of fire. Now remember, the devil is God's devil. He can only do what God permits. And remember what Jesus says here in verse 8, but all these things are merely the beginning, the beginning of birth pangs, which tells you there are greater birth pangs to come. And after the middle event found in verse 15, it's going to get much more intense. Paul uses the same imagery. We studied it when we studied the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 5. He said, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. Even so, here in the tribulation, it progressively gets worse and worse and worse. And it's not until, as he will later say in this section, immediately after the tribulation, that Jesus will come back in power and in glory. Now that brings us to the fifth mark, the fifth sign. And this coming time will also be a time of cruelty, a time of cruelty. 
Jesus continues now in verse 9. They will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Now look, if you are a true Christian today, you cannot help but being defamed. It's hard to be a member of this church and not to experience some member of, some kind of expression of persecution. Oh, you, you community Bible church, you know. You're all homophobic over there, and you know, you, you all believe that me living with my girlfriend is wrong, and you think it's, you know, wrong for me to get drunk even though I'm not hurting anyone, and I hear it all. I get the letters that you don't get. We ain't seen nothing yet. Today, Bible-believing Christians, they're whipping boys for a lost world. And they mock us and make fun of us night after night on the television. Now, Hallmark last week had a movie with two females at the end of the movie kissing. It's in your face. But this isn't anything yet. Because notice the fifth seal here in Revelation 6, verses 9 and 10. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who've been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? Which means they were murdered on those who dwell on the earth. And the means by which they will be murdered, Revelation 20 verse 20 and verse 4 says they'll be beheaded. That's how they'll take us out or take those out who are here during that time. I won't be here. <laughs> verse 10, at that time, Jesus says back in the Olivet Discourse, many will fall away. I mean, you got a choice. Okay, they may mock you now. What if you're living during the tribulation because you were lost when the rapture came? You got a choice. You want your head? Or you want no head. Many will fall away. In fact, they will betray one another and hate one another. The word fall away is scandalizo. We get our word scandalize. And when it's in the passive, it is a choice that they make from within. Paul said it in these words in 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. I got a pastor who will tell me what I want to hear. It will make me feel good. Right out in the margin, Matthew 10, 21 and 22, Jesus said, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who is endured to the end who will be saved. They'll betray one another, I counseled a couple, not members of our church. I spent an hour with them this week. You'd think they'd have a solid pastor they could go to. My sister, she said, is now come out lesbian. And everyone in the family approves of it. She wants to marry her lover. And we're the only ones against it. And they're telling us we're unloving. Those are the only loving people in that family who will tell that sister the tr truth about a sin that will damn her. She needs to be born again so she can be changed from within and have new life. I'm telling you, a day is coming when parents will take out their children. Ah, we've got someone in our home. Cut his head off. And children will betray parents and brother, brother, sister, sister. And so, believing these lies, verse 11, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Even today, cultural Christians, they don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be the odd man out. I've been a Christian since 1978 and in ministry, 1974 and in ministry since 1978. 
And I've always seen liberals who have been discombobulated and confused in basic doctrine. But I want to tell you, I have never ever in my life as in the last three or four years seen such a hooray of evil, twisted, distorted doctrine walk right in the front door of the evangelical church where people are buying it. But you know, we want to appease everybody. So if you want to be a same-sex attracted Christian, that's okay. If you want to live with your girlfriend, that's okay. We don't want anyone to be upset. And Jesus says in verse 12, describing the climate, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Lawlessness or iniquity, John says sin is lawlessness, will be increased. It will be multiplied literally. Now on the one hand, God recognizes that a Christian can love the world, and so we're admonished, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. But on the other hand, God wants us to know that if this is your bent and your way of life, you've never had a new birth from above. But listen, when you love the things of the world, you lose your saltiness. When you compromise in your thinking, you lose your ability to dispel clear light. And so Jesus warned the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, I have this against you that you have left your first love. But then Jesus adds here in verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now there's a convergence of signs that are going on. Israel's in the land, the days of Noah, the days of Lot, growing apostasy. It's all happening at once. And when the church is removed, people will either live for Jesus, and unless those days had been cut short, nobody would be left to enter into the coming kingdom. No living soul on the earth would be able to enter into the kingdom. But God is going to take the Jewish people. He's going to hide them. We study that in Revelation 12. But only the one who endures to the end will be saved. You say, am I saved by endurance? No. You're not saved by endurance, but if you are saved, you will endure. That's the biblical truth. You're not saved by perseverance, but if you are saved, you will persevere. And that's why Jesus can say, the one who endures to the end, the one who will never renounce me, even at the cost of his own blood, he's got the genuine item. He'll enter the kingdom. Six, it will be a time of sights and sounds in the cosmos. A time of sights and sounds in the cosmos. Now Luke's all of that discourse is quite compressed, but he adds a detail that Matthew doesn't give us. So Revelation 21, 11 says, I mean Luke 21, 11 says, and there will be massive earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. We just read that in Matthew. And there will be terrible sights and great signs from heaven. Here's how John describes it in the sixth seal. I looked, when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth, made of hair, the whole moon became like blood. So the physical universe appears to be coming apart and John unfolds six marks that will happen. There's going to be a shaking. And by the way, this happens halfway into the tribulation. Then it happens in a greater way right at the end of the tribulation at the second coming. He speaks here of an earthquake. It's the word seismos. We get our word seismology from it. But he accentuates it with a great earthquake. We've always had earthquakes. But there's coming three big ones that we haven't seen yet. And the revelation unfolds each one. And it's going to produce such terror. Revelation 6 says men will want to hide themselves and kill themselves. Second, he says the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. Again, that's not totally surprising because God made it black. At midday, it became like midnight when Jesus hung on the cross and for three hours, there was total darkness. And the whole moon became like blood. There's the third mark. You know, some years ago, there was a, a number of books called The Four Blood Moons and People would call me on the Bible line, what do you think about the four blood moons? I said, I don't think anything about them. I think they're just some guys selling books to line their pockets. As it turns out, what I said was absolutely true. It's not that I'm so smart, I'm just reading the Bible. The only significant blood moons are during the tribulation, and then that will happen at the end of the tribulation. But naive Christians, oh, get the book. Hagee wrote it, must be good. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth. 
There's the fourth mark. As a fig tree casts its unripe grapes when shaken by the great wind. Now, that's interesting. The stars fall to the earth. You've got to let Scripture interpret Scripture because in 8.2, you see a third of the stars are, are darkened. So what's he speaking about? Well, the word stars is the word aster. We get our word asteroid from it, and I take it that he is simply using the language of observation. A few days ago in Seabrook, we had a magnificent sunset. It was just beautiful. You know, it had rained, and the sun came, a lot of clouds. It was just breathtaking. I didn't say to my wife, what a glorious earth rotation. No, we use the language of observation like the weatherman, a sunset. And I think what John is doing here is he's using the language of observation. We speak of a shooting star. Well, if a star hit the earth, there'd be nothing left. (laughs) Uh, We're not speaking of literal shooting stars, but certainly asteroids. And some of you who follow this, if you remember in 1833, November the 13th, They had this shooting stars, so to speak, asteroids filling the skies. It led to such terror on the planet. People fell down on their knees and begged God for mercy to save them. And then, of course, in 1908, an asteroid hit the earth, and it literally destroyed 700 square miles of forest. Well, there's coming a day when they're going to see a sight in the heaven. In addition, fifth, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. I don't know how to explain that, but somehow like a piece of parchment rolled up maybe in two directions, there's gonna be some kind of atmospheric effects that people will be able to watch. And then the sixth and final seal, it says, and in every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Maybe that happens through the asteroids, God's bunker busters, and they come down and literally destroy the islands of the earth. Finally, seven, I'm done. Give me two minutes. A time of mass conversions. This is going to be a time of mass conversions. Now think about where we've been here for just a moment. Let me bring it up on this chart. Remember, we're paralleling Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 and 7. We know Revelation 6 and 7 happens after the church is raptured. A door is opened up in heaven. The church is taken up. And so the church is not mentioned again until it comes back with Jesus. The saints you read of is not, are not church saints, but tribulation saints. And so what we're reading in Revelation 6, you think it's accidental? False cries. First seal, the white horse of deception. Wars. Second seal, the red horse of war. Famines. The third black horse of famine. Death. The fourth seal on the pale horse of death. Martyrs, the fifth seal, those under the altar, slaughtered, beheaded. Cosmic changes, signs in the heavens, sixth seal, cosmic changes. And now the worldwide preaching of the gospel, and we'll look at in our times to come, about a middle event that will divide this seven years called the abomination of desolation, and that will bring great tribulation, the trumpet in bold judgments. Now look at verse 14. Jesus says here in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached And the whole world is a testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. The gospel for the forgiveness of sins is going to be preached during this time to the whole world. You know, sometimes people say, hey, you know, we only got this many people groups left. You think we're at the end. And just as soon as we get some of those people groups covered, there's a hundred more that pop up. God is going to pull this off. He's going to pull it off During the time of the great tribulation, you say, well, how is he going to do it? Well, that's Revelation 7. Go home and read it. 144,000 Jewish missionaries and evangelists will preach the gospel to the whole world. And if they were not enough, read Revelation 11. Two witnesses. I suspect Moses and Elijah won because the Bible teaches the second coming of Elijah. Malachi prophesied it. Jesus affirmed it. And certainly Moses and Elijah have parallel ministries, but whoever they are, those two witnesses are going to preach the gospel. And if they don't cover it all, listen to this angel. For the first time in history, God will preach the gospel through an angel. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. There'll be no unreached people groups. 
And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and springs of water. Now what should we do today? How should we apply this? Number one, you should be a witness for Jesus. You should be a witness for Jesus. We need to witness for Jesus. This time is coming. And there's coming a time when no man can work and you'll be able to witness to zero. You know, there's one thing that we will not do in heaven and we won't win anybody to Jesus. (laughs) No lost souls in heaven. It's our responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. You should invite someone next week just to the concert. How could God use that in their life? Look, we just baptized four people in the first service and two of them simply because of an invitation, someone invited them to meet the pastor, got saved a week ago, got baptized this morning. Just invited them. We should witness however that may unfold. Secondly, we should be realistic. I know you get all these Christians talking about, I'm praying for revival. There's nothing wrong about praying for revival. But a lot of God's people are getting disillusioned. They say, well, where is this revival that I've been praying for? Because there's coming a time when there will be no revival. The only revival, quote unquote, will be after the church is gone and the 144,000 and an angel and the two witnesses reach the unreached people. Third and finally, we need to be ready. Now listen, we're going to cover it. But if you're here, you're listening somewhere in the world today and you've never received Jesus, don't think after the church is removed. If it happened this afternoon, don't think that tomorrow morning you'll become a believer because I will document for you from Holy Scripture that there will be no new believers during the tribulation concerning people who before the tribulation, before the rapture has heard the gospel. Because you refuse to believe the truth, the Bible says you will believe a lie. Today is the day to be saved. Now, Holy Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture that Jesus gave us, that he's not left us in the dark. Help someone today to call upon Jesus. Would you do that? Would you pray this? You're not saved by a prayer. You're saved by faith in Jesus. But in faith, reach out in your heart and simply say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. You died on a cross for me. You were raised from the dead for me. And I trust you now by your shed blood to forgive me and to save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Because you saved me, I'll not be ashamed of you. I'll make it public. Now, Father, help those of us who've met the Lord Jesus to be faithful stewards of the gospel. We ask it in his holy name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing our hymn of invitation. Maybe you're here and you need to make a public decision. You may be in Grays like the woman last week who came down front. You may be in Graniteville. You may be here, but there's a decision you need to make to confess Jesus, to be baptized, to join this church. Here's your chance. Matt's going to lead us. If no one comes in the first verse, we'll stop right there. I invite you now to step out.